Well, good afternoon for those of you in the United States. Good evening or good morning, uh, depending on where you are across the globe. Thanks for choosing to join us at SADS Facebook Live for episode number 29. I'm glad to get to be with you. My name is Mike Ackerman, and I'm a genetic cardiologist at Mayo Clinic and the director of Mayo Clinic's Winland Smith Rice Genetic Heart Rhythm Clinic. And for the last many years now, I think 14, I've had the privilege of serving as the president of the Sudden Arrhythmia Death Syndromes Foundation, the SADS Foundation. So on behalf of Alice Laura, our CEO, uh, I wanna just thank you for being with us since March 27. Believe it or not, that was our first one. And now we've been together these last uh, almost six months during the COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And many of you have been uh, joined, have been with us from the very beginning. Uh, some of you I see coming on already and uh, hello to you, Brianna. And I think we'll probably have 40 or 50 of you live together with me right now. And then thousands watch it uh, on their own time. And over the last six months, we've had almost 100,000 views. Go to the SADS website at SADS, www.sads.org or to the SADS YouTube channel. And you can look at all of these episodes. They've archived. Uh, you can share them with your friends. We've some, done some really great ones from the interview with Peter Schwartz and Sylvia Priori, Susan Etheridge and me taking your the top 10 questions posed over the years. Uh, Chris Semsarian from Down Under, Arthur Wilda in Amsterdam. Just some really special ones. Many of you know the one that I had the privilege of doing with Stacy Rizza here, Mayo Clinic Infectious Disease Specialist. Send that one to your friends. That is still very timely. We did that in July and everything she said and we chatted about with respect to COVID-19 is still as relevant uh, today as it was when Stacy and I filmed that one. Today's your day where I take your questions as they come on the screen in real time and I'll try to answer as many of them spontaneously as I can. Before I do, just to remind you of, of a couple of things. Worldwide, we are past 28 million cases and over 910,000 deaths. Uh, in the United States, we are at 6.4 million recorded cases of COVID-19 and 192,000 deaths. So we have a case fatality rate in the United States of 3%. That's a much lower number than remember when we were together in March 27, things seemed very scary. And in fact, why did we even do this at the SADS Foundation in the first place? We did it because of you, because of many of you calling us um, out of extreme anxiety when that paper came out. Remember the paper? The paper came out that said, if you have heart disease, you are at much greater risk of a bad SARS-CoV-2 COVID-19 experience. And families started to call us at the SADS Foundation, call us at Mayo Clinic and said, and asked, is long QT syndrome heart disease? Is CPVT heart disease? Is Brugada syndrome heart disease? And we had to spend some time uh, teaching ourselves, remember that yes, these are heart diseases. These are genetic heart diseases, but no, these are not the heart diseases associated with increased risk. Not, not, not. And we now can say that with even more confidence. We've been looking at thousands of families across the globe, and there is just not a signal of increased risk for those who have our genetic heart diseases, long QT, CPVT, but are otherwise healthy. Heart disease and bad COVID-19 outcomes are older people with coronary artery disease, heart disease, hypertension, and the single most important risk factor is those with those heart diseases and obesity, not our family. So we dealt with that, remember? And we got over that, we could say, okay, I can recalibrate that I'm basically gonna be just fine if I'm otherwise healthy. We also had to deal with that scary number. Remember in Italy and in New York City that if you were hospitalized from your COVID-19 and got intubated, that the death sentence was about a 50 to 75% chance of dying. And now we know that the real number 
for all COVID-19 patients in the United States that the death rate is 3%. And in other places, it's lower. Here at Mayo Clinic, it is 1.2%. If you are infected, that's the chances of dying here in Olmsted County. Uh, we also know that the virus isn't infecting all of us left and right. Remember, we had the sense that everybody has it. It's kind of incredible, isn't it? 6.4 million, that's a lot of people in the United States. That's just under 2% of the USA population. In Olmsted County, where I live, 1.4% of us in this county have the infection or had the infection. And that number is kind of, is going to be depending on where you live throughout the world. I look at various things and that Johns Hopkins COVID-19 uh, dashboard is incredibly helpful. Go there, use it, look it up and see what it is in your county. It gives you a good feel of things. I look it up for my son who's at Baylor University, Sikkim Bears, and Gen Z Bear for there, the Baylor University dashboard says that the infection rate, 3.5% of the campus, students, faculty, employees uh, have or had SARS-CoV-2 infection. So I can use that to talk with the Jens and ask him and remind him of the precautionary measures. So we started this whole deal uh, almost six months ago because of that first erroneous paper or the misleading angle of it, of heart disease and bad outcomes when, nope, not yours. And we've continued doing it, trying to give you real-time up-to-date information as accurate as we can, without bias, staying colorblind. Um, I'm colorblind, some of you might not have known that, but I'm profoundly red, green, colorblind. And as to this topic of COVID-19, we've also tried to stay red and blue colorblind as well, and just tell you what we know about it and how it affects you and your SADS condition. And then we started talking about just our SADS conditions in general. So that's just to bring you from where we were then and where we are now and where we're gonna be going. And at the end of the program, I'll give you sort of a rundown of the next three weeks. So go to the website, sads.org, look at the archive, share them with people, and uh, hopefully uh, they will serve a good purpose. So Gemma, hello there, Gemma, thanks for this. She's asking us, how do parents of children with CPVT allow their child independence when they don't have an internal defibrillator? How do you go to walking to secondary school, going with friends? Do you carry an external defibrillator? They're ready for those next steps. And whether you have CPVT or long QT or Brugada syndrome, if you are a mom or a dad of any of these children, this whole question of moving them to independence when they're not under your watch is a really great question. It's a great question for me with my four children and moving them to independence, uh, uh, independent of their genetic heart status because mine don't have uh, long QT syndrome. But I think the first thing is it takes time. You'll figure it out. Every family is different. But the biggest thing to keep reminding yourself of is if I have your child's CPVT, long QT, Brugada, well-treated, the breakthrough event rate on therapy is incredibly low. For us at Mayo Clinic, less than 1% of our patients will have a breakthrough event each year. That's really low. The lethal breakthrough event of tragedy is unbelievably low. I take care of over 1,500 patients with long QT syndrome, over 100 with CPVT. And we, over 20 years now, we have less than 10 deaths that have occurred from their disease while under our watch being treated. We're very blessed and grateful for that. But that's what we should start to be expecting. And so in other words, you're not gonna have to worry about independence. The biggest thing you need to do is to help them own the treatment, own their beta blocker therapy so that they can do and you can be confident in their medication adherence. Will they be taking their medicines? A lot of people say they won't, they're teenagers, they won't do it. That's nonsense. Our teenagers 
with these conditions can absolutely become reliable beta blocker taking citizens that don't need mom and dad's reminder. So if you can make sure that you're confident in, are they taking their medications? Are they doing the drill? The likelihood that they will have a breakthrough event at your home or anybody's home is incredibly low. So be confident uh, in that. Um, uh, Jessica, I'd love to see your, your boys with long QT when it works out. Now, here's another question. It's from Beck. Um, I have to read fast on this sidebar. Remember, try to make the questions really, really pithy. Uh, that's the word of the day. Um, so I can do it. She has LQT1. Does this mean I have long QT syndrome? I've been told variant information. I've been confirmed with a gene Casey in Q1. Oh, this is a great question, Beck. So a lot of importance of connecting the dots between your genetic test result and whether you have a disease called long QT syndrome. So for example, you gave the gene KCNQ1. That gene is the single most common genetic cause of long QT. That Those with mutations in that gene are said to have type one long QT syndrome or LQT1. So if it's a true disease mutation, yes, you have LQT1 genetically, but how are you, the owners of the mutation, expressing it clinically? What does the electrocardiogram show? Have you ever had a torsadogenic experience where the heart has gone into the danger rhythm to make you do fainting or seizing or worse? And so there's a lot of things as to what's the strength of the genetic evidence as do you have genetic vulnerability and what's been the person who owns the genetic variance clinical experience? How is it showing itself? So hopefully that helps clarify a couple things. Aaron's her QTC. So now we're talking about the expression of the long QT mutation has been around 460 to 470. But yesterday it was 440. Will these numbers fluctuate? Absolutely. I want you as a long QT family to know your QTC. Just like diabetics know their sugar, their glucose, they know their range. Uh, I want you to know your QTC. We have all of our families who see us write down their annual QTC from their annual evaluation. And we take note of it. Is it changing? Did it change at all as we transition from being a girl to being a young woman or from being a young woman to an older young woman or who now has entered menopause or a boy who now has testosterone and is a young man? Because those, these hormones can affect your QTC value. Your state of health or your anxiety level can affect your QTC value. So there's a lot of mistakes that are made out there where a patient had a normal faint and is then goes to the doctor for the emergency department and is nervous and gets hooked up to the ECG for the first time and is anxious and the QTC measures a big number. And then the doctors say, oh, you have long QT syndrome. When not at all, not at all. All you had was a normal faint that gave your body a post faint stress reaction for which the QT interval inflated and once you got back to who you are, a couple of days later, a week later, your QT number comes back to your own baseline. So know your QTC. That range from 460 to 470 and 440 is a completely normal swing of the number. And we take note of that. And in fact, we have a paper coming out that shows those who are at greater risk of a long QT triggered event are those who's every year, every year, their yearly QTC is above 490, for example. Whereas those who one year they're 495, another year they're 450, another year they're 470, those individuals where the QTC bounces around like that, they're at much lower risk. So yes, it, it, it can change. Great question. I better keep up the pace here because the questions are coming in. Una, hi, Una. Um, a couple of echoes, normal. Others said borderline. Is this common finding in women? Okay, great question about 
mitral valve prolapse and bileaflet mitral valve prolapse. We don't talk about that very much in the SADS Foundation, but it's one of the newer entities of what we've called arrhythmogenic bileaflet mitral valve prolapse syndrome, which Mayo Clinic described as a syndrome about six years ago. But you have to remember there's a lot of noise. So mitral valve prolapse affects one to 2% of all of us have that. So it's a nothing. Overall, the vast majority of people who have mitral valve prolapse, it confers no risk. There's a very tiny sliver of mitral valve prolapse individuals where their bileaflet prolapse, both leaflets prolapse, but there's more. They have that plus an electrical signal, plus a woman signal, plus funny looking T waves. And then you get to a very small number who have this actual syndrome of arrhythmic bileaflet mitral valve prolapse syndrome. So with yours, if one echoes normal and one shows mild, doesn't matter, doesn't matter at all because those who have this syndrome, the bileaflet mitral valve prolapse is not subtle. So it's obvious. And then if you take a close look, they have an extra feature of MAD, M-A-D, for mitral annular disjunction. So Una, no worries about that. Um, you're not going to have to uh, concern yourself about that in all likelihood. Jessica, LQT5, her gene is KCNE1, not Q1. And seven-year-old, many episodes of the normal faint, vasovagal syncope, is type five high risk for sudden cardiac arrest? What is considered symptomatic? Great question. Has the loop recorder or link? I like the loop recorder, but I don't use it that often. And in her situation, that's exactly when I use it, is somebody who has long QT, type one, two, three, four, doesn't matter which one, who's having normal fainting, because remember, normal fainting or vasovagal syncope, that's a fancy word for normal fainting, which I did when I was in eighth grade. I can tell you that story sometime. Uh, our long QT families also get to do the normal faint. And a lot of mistakes are made out there because people forget that. Physicians forget that. And they get nervous when a long QT person faints and they too quickly conclude it was their long QT that made them do that. And then we better make treatment more intense when it may just have been long QT, asymptomatic, doing great. And then the normal faint just happened for which we don't need to change much at all, except get better sleep, get better exercise, drink a lot of non-caffeinated beverages, 60 to 80 ounces of water, do lower extremity weight training, eat your Doritos, salt intake and so forth. So when do I do the loop recorder? I add the loop recorder, which is a rhythm detector that you can inject just underneath your skin. The battery lasts about three years is if I'm just not sure about the faint. If I know that that faint was a normal heart faint, uh, then I don't need to do anything except salt and water diet. But if the circumstances were a little bit off, or I just want to make sure for your own peace of mind that if you faint again, we're going to have an immediate rhythm spell correlation. So I can tell you, not only did I think your faint was normal, but the recording device told us your faint was normal. In other words, it wasn't your long QT. Um, type 5 is not at high risk. So in general, LQT5 is overall a fairly mild version of genetic long QT syndrome and symptomatic long QT5 or symptomatic long QT anything would be where the patient fainted in a way that I thought it was their long QT doing the danger rhythm or fainted and then had a generalized seizure or fainted and had a generalized seizure and went into full cardiac arrest. Anything else is not your long QT. Oh, I felt a funny heartbeat, palpitations, not your long QT. Oh, I felt lightheaded, lightheaded, dizzy, woozy, probably not your long QT. So I keep symptomatic to that. Jan is asking about the Brugada gene, uh, GPD1L. I think it's uh, G, 
DP, but um, I forget the GPD-1L. Actually, you're right. Um, Jen, there's a debate out there. All of the Brugada genes, all 23 of them, have gotten demoted to a di disputed evidence or a limited evidence Brugada gene, except the original one, the gene SCN5A that gives rise to Brugada syndrome about 20 to 30 percent of the time. There's investigators, Dr. Barry London at University of Iowa discovered the GPD1L family and mutation and is working to try to say, wait a second, not limited evidence. We know it can do Brugada syndrome, so stay tuned. There'll be more to come there. Um, I'm just scrolling down. I'm not picking honestly. I'm just, I decided today to just start at the top and work my way straight through. And Chingy is the youngest of three sisters, the oldest, with long QT. Diagnosed but not yet genetically verified. Sent the genetic test. Ah, great question. And what's the likelihood that your test will be come back positive? I love that question, uh, Miss Lynn, because I'm not sure I said your first name correctly. If any of my patients truly have long QT syndrome and I order the genetic test, that test will come back positive 80% of the time, at least 80% of the time. And almost all of that 80% will be LQT1, LQT2, or LQT3. So, and there are some times where depending on your story, I can already say it's going to come back positive for LQT1, bet the ranch, or it's going to come back positive for LQT2. You have long QT syndrome, you fainted or had a seizure when the alarm clock went off, you just had another one when you were two months postpartum, you are going to be LQT2 if that's the story. And so you can anticipate the likelihood that the genetic test will come back positive with a high confidence. That's 80%. That number is really important because that tells me if your genetic test comes back negative, so that blood test by itself rules out 80% of all long QT syndrome. The evidence from your story, from your ECG, from your stress test, better be really convincing that you still deserve the diagnosis of long QT syndrome. Otherwise, we better start to retreat. So if I know you have long QT syndrome and it comes back negative, no problem. You're just in the 10 to 20% who have what we call genotype negative or negative genetic test long QT syndrome. But if I'm seeing you as a second, third, fourth opinion evaluation, and you have a negative genetic test, then that deserves a pause, time out for us to say, how good was all of the evidence in the first place to warrant this diagnosis in the first place? And unfortunately or fortunately, we've had the privilege of removing the diagnosis of long QT syndrome in about a thousand people over the last 20 years. Uh, so hopefully, Ms. Lynn, that gives you a frame of reference. Um, Ruthie's asking the best method for getting my son to see a psychiatrist that has experience with cardiac patients. Well, the best method, if it's reluctance on your son's part or dealing with it, is just continued conversation. There's no tricks. There's no magic secrets. It's just talk. Continue to talk. Figure out how is your child thriving, son or daughter? Uh, there is help to be had out there. There is, are sports psychologists, for example. There are child and adolescent psychologists. There's adult psychiatrists and so forth. See if they're ready uh, for additional conversation. Um, Brianne is asking if they find a KC and Q1 variant, but your QT intervals are normal, what happens then? Oh, that's a good one. Why is it a good one? Because there's a couple possibilities there. If, you're, if you have a KCNQ1 variant for which they're thinking you have LQT1, then your ECG either needs to show it at rest, the QT problem, or if not, your stress test has to show it. 
So in other words, if your QT behaves completely normal before, during, and after the stress test, then I start to throw a lot of cold water on that casein Q1 variant and say, I'm not so ready to call it an LQT1 variant. It may simply be a benign variant. Then there are those who have a true LQT1 variant. There's no doubt about the, the variant's potential for disease causation, but in that particular owner, their ECG looks normal. And if their stress test also looks normal, then that's almost the person who we would call non-penetrant LQT1, meaning it's in your genetic code, but it has never penetrated into your electrical code. So that person would be viewed as, as close to zero risk as we know, and may not actually need much intervention at all, except to be told, let's probably skip ever taking medications that are on the QT hit list. And Jim is asking about his wife and two children who have type two long QT. They're on the beta blocker propranolol. I like that one. They're doing great. They covered two AEDs for our household. Um, please check with your insurance to see if they cover. Yeah, so it's a good comment. Insurance companies will often cover the automatic external defibrillators. I write that I'm uh, recommending it, prescribing an AED, but I always remind the families that even though I'm prescribing it, the likelihood of needing it, if I'm doing well in treating you well, is gonna be almost zero. It's been four AED rescue shocks in four of our over 600 treated children for 20 years now. I keep reminding them of that so that you as the family, you're not on pins and needles thinking that the AED uh, is gonna be used today or tomorrow or the next day. It almost never will. And if the insurance company is not able to cover it again, we use the, the, uh, the advocacy organization LifeSure where they do the interference with the insurance companies on behalf of my families to help secure one. Sherry is asking about her nine-year-old who has LQT3. So that's the sodium channel version of long QT. And that's the version where about five to 10% of all long QT families are type three long QT. Should you be extra concerned when you're out boating, swimming, tubing? I'm, I've seen different posts regarding dark water. No, don't have to be concerned almost at all because LQT3 and water mixed together, meaning we have almost never, in fact, I think it's gonna be never, have seen an LQT3 individual who's done his or her event in the water. I think my one exception uh, to that was a synchronized swimmer who was doing those deep, um, long underwater breath holds and then it fainted and then did their long QT. And that probably, that synchronized swimming activity of the intense long breath hold probably activated the vagal nerve to drive the heart rate slower like the seal, you know, the, the seal submersion dive reflex. And then that triggered uh, or upset the apple cart. So for the most part, LQT3 and water uh, is a is a good uh, combination. Uh, uh, Miss Lynn, thanks for the feedback. I'm glad I hit the mark on, on that one. Oh, oh, wow, look at all of these. These are amazing. Okay, I'm gonna go, we have, we have 11 minutes, that's incredible. We might have to do this again if you like this. Um, Laura is asking about a VUS, a variant of uncertain significance in SCN5A. You guys know it now. SCN5A is a gene that builds the heart sodium channel for which real mutations in that gene can cause LQT3, real mutations in that gene that damage the sodium channel in an opposite way cause Brugada syndrome. And then we have the VUS conundrum in that same gene and in all genes. Laura's part of a family history of sudden cardiac death, uh, told that it looked to be subtle type two Brigada pattern, but it's not enough to diagnose because it's not type one. Does type two ever turn into type one? Is type two less dangerous? So great, 
uh, question, Laura, uh, try to unpack that quickly, is there's a certain ECG pattern that is strongly suggestive of the possibility of Brugada syndrome, for which 20 to 30% of Brugada syndrome people have an SCN5A mutation. That pattern is called the type 1 Brugada pattern. There's a nonspecific pattern called the type 2 pattern that doesn't mean anything by itself unless that type 2 pattern changes to a type 1 pattern when the doctors move your ECG leads up your chest. So most programs like ours here at Mayo Clinic would give you three ECGs in a row with the certain leads in their standard spot, V1, V2, V3, and then we record a second ECG moving them up one space and then do a third ECG moving them up another space. And if the type two pattern changes to the type one pattern, then we become uh, more suspicious about the possibility of Brugada syndrome. A type two pattern by itself uh, doesn't mean much at all. A type two pattern that changes is potentially more important. And the most important is those Brugada patients who every ECG they ever have all the time, they show the type one pattern. So they are persistent with their type one pattern. Those Brugada individuals are at higher risk than those where the pattern comes, comes and goes. Jan, I think is getting a two for one special today. It's your lucky day. Is it common to have Brugada and SVT? Uncommon, so Brugada syndrome in a 12 year old, um, it's gonna happen because SVT, supraventricular tachycardia, and there's many different kinds, is actually a more common heart rhythm condition, much more common than Brugada syndrome. So we're bound to have individuals who happen to have two things. So just like Jan, you got a two for one special with two questions today. Some of our patients get a two for one where they have long QT and SVT or long Brugada and SVT. And um, if, if your uh, child has SVT and it's the standard SVT, then the doctors can take care of the standard SVT. Holly's asking a great question about telling the difference between anxiety symptoms and arrhythmia triggered symptoms. I love that question because we well know that a lot of our families struggle with anxiety. We know that anxiety uh, is a clinically diagnosed entity in about seven to 10% of all patients who go see a doctor. So it doesn't stand, it's not a surprise at all that you can have long QT and be dealing with mental health associated anxiety, Brugada and anxiety. There, it stands to good reason why a sudden death predisposing condition like long QT syndrome would be anxiety generating. So I'm amazed with my families that you guys do as well as you do uh, with your long QT, your Brugada, your CPVT. How do you tell the difference? Well, true long QT events make you instantaneously faint. So most of my long QT families, I constantly will tell you, if you're telling me you felt something funny, and you got worried about it and you were fine and you continue doing what you're doing, that almost for sure, 100% for sure, was not your long QT giving you a miniature warning. That was a normal skip beats that then activated your brain heart connection to accentuate your anxiety thinking that your heart is misbehaving. So uh, most of the time, you will start to learn if you if you sort of take to the bank that I did not faint suddenly, I did not have a generalized seizure, and I didn't do cardiac arrest where somebody had to shock me back. So whatever I'm feeling and sensing, it's not my disease long QT. It's other stuff going on. If you keep telling yourself that, keep telling yourself that, you will help get a hold, I call it sort of the noose, and some of my patients who've been here know that I can never remember whether it's the cobra or the python that wraps its prey and chokes it. I think it's the python. 
So whichever snake it is that does that, that's what this anxiety, you know, a hold is on the person. And when they can break it by saying, no, that's not my long QT. That is not my long QT. Then it can start to loosen up and you can sort of then navigate with the other very important issue that might need medication therapy on its own. Meaning I might need to be treating my whole body uh, anxiety. Um, oh, that deserved a longer answer because that's a really important one, Holly. So thanks for asking it. Um, Brianne, um, I'm going to skip that one if that's okay, Brianne. I, I it will be hard for me in five minutes. I'm looking. Uh, Brianna is asking, how often are new genes discovered and added to the genetic test panels? So, um, not very often. The big genes, the big three for long QT, they were discovered in 1995 and 1996. Those big three still explain 80% of the syndrome. Our research program at Mayo was responsible for finding most of the LQT4 through 17 genes, but they are tiny add-ons. Practically speaking, they don't matter that much, unless of course you're the family with that minor gene. Uh, CPVT, the big gene, RYR2 for CPVT number one, that accounts for two thirds of all CPVT, discovered about 2001. And so we haven't had a big contributor for that 30% remnant of CPVT found in 19 years. We found a couple of minor ones. And as those minor ones get found and proven, they get added on to the commercial test. So the commercial test companies are constantly reviewing the evidence. And if a gene, so for example, we and others discovered calmodulin mediated long QT, first discovered by... Uh, Leah Crotty and Peter Schwartz out of Italy, and we added the third calmodulin gene uh, subsequently. Those genes definitely cause long QT syndrome in a small, small number. When the commercial companies saw the evidence, they quickly added calmodulin genes, the CALM, C-A-L-M genes, to the long QT panel. So they're constantly upgrading it and, and doing it. So, so in other words, you would be continually reviewed as to should we repeat your genetic test based upon current knowledge of your own story and current knowledge of what is the current genetic test panel. The one group of patients that should absolutely have their genetic test repeated pronto is if you truly have long QT or truly have CPVT, but you were genetically tested back in the research era, say in my research lab, where we were using our research tools. And if we told you you were negative, that we never found anything, that negative is not equal to a negative commercial test. Our research lab assays are not, were not, are not as good as the commercial genetic test assays. So every patient of mine who I know you have long QT, but you were negative from my research lab, we would always order the real genetic test on you now that the genetic tests are so commercially available, often reimbursed, and if not, the price points are so reachable, and we get an answer back in two to three weeks. So that's the one group of patients who I always uh, recommend repeat genetic testing because every long QT CPVT family deserves to have the real genetic test to come back negative and not rely on a research test result that came from my lab or another lab throughout the world that said nothing was found. Uh, well, we have many to to do and i would love to do the rest that i'm seeing from leah and linda and sherry um but our time is up we've hit the top of the hour and to respect your time and to keep uh these uh sad facebook lives 
are archived for con comfortable review. We've said we better stop uh, at the top of the hour. So we, uh, if you like this format, let the SADS Foundation know so that we know how often you would like to do a question and answer session uh, with just me. I loved it. This stimulates the daylights out of me to try to see this. Your questions are amazing. You all are amazing. And uh, on this incredible day, I don't think it's uh, we should just pass over the significance of this day. 19 years ago, it's unbelievable to think that we are now celebrating or remembering. I don't think we're celebrating a very holy day, a Memorial Day in the history of the United States. And so much has happened in these 19 years. And so again, I think of all of those families uh, and those lost in 911. We'll never be the same. We will never forget. I will never forget. I hope you never forget uh, as well. And also, never forget, put on the mask. They work. It's easy. Remind your friends, wash your hands, don't touch your face, stay six feet apart when you can. All of these things can keep that infection rate in your community at these 1%, 2%, or Baylor University 3.5% numbers until and unless we get an effective preventative medication called a vaccine. We'll update you on the status of a vaccine in, in December when we bring Stacy back, but we have some really good programs coming up. Next week, join us back. I'm gonna interview a couple of our board members, our non-physician board members who really are critical to the SADS Foundation. We'll have a conversation with them and then we'll take some more of your questions. Two weeks from today, we're gonna to talk about return to play activities and considerations for SADS families. Three weeks from today, we're gonna to have one of our really important scientific advisory board members, Dr. Sammy Viskin from Israel join us. It was his birthday this week. Happy birthday, Sammy. And uh, join us to talk uh, about his assessment of important updates over the last three months or since 2020 of publications in the field that have advanced the science and advanced our knowledge about SADS conditions. And I think you're going to like this so much that I'm going to have Dr. Sammy Viskin join me probably three to four times a year to give a quarterly update on research or SADS condition associated breakthroughs. So we have an, a good lineup. Send other suggestions that you might have. Let us know how often you would like to have us just do this together. Uh, and we will, we will start to schedule those uh, as well. Last, oh, look at this. You, Jan got a two for one special, so I'm giving you one. This is my daughter, 17, and Grace, and my granddaughter, Jaden, last week. They surprised us, and Jaden is now seven and a half months old. So I love both of them, so I hope you enjoy that. Ever since March 27, when we first joined, you have been watching my granddaughter grow up with me a little bit. So thanks for letting me uh, uh, share those with you. I wish you all the best. Until next week, stay well, stay safe, refuse to fear, and uh, live and thrive. Be well, everyone. Blessings to you.